Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Combined PGTA and PGTM Analysis from a Single Embryo Biopsy, Experience, Learning and Benefits. I'm Garima Sood of Thermo Fisher Scientific and I will be your moderator for today's event. I would now like to welcome our speaker, Ms. T. Z. Tian, Group Chief Embryologist of TMC Fertility and Women's Specialist Center. Ms. Z. Tian, you may begin your presentation now. Hello, hi everybody. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here with you. Um, I actually want to begin by thanking the Fisher for giving us this opportunity to share our experience. I'd just like to uh, share with you our experience on combining the PGTA and PGTM analysis test for a single biopsy. So I just introduced myself. My name is TC. I'm a embryologist, uh, actually. I'm uh, running the lab, the genetic lab, and also the IVF laboratory in TMC Fertility in Thompson Hospital, Malaysia. So we have been um, getting some hands-on on this PGTA and PGTM analysis uh, for about uh, one and a half years. And hopefully today's session, I will be able to give you some useful information and you will enjoy it. So before I begin, this is the disclaimer. Okay, so we will just go quickly with some very basic things. What is pre-implantation genetic diagnosis uh, or the PGT? It's actually the earliest form of prenatal genetic diagnosis where we, the abnormal embryos will be identified and only those genetically normal embryos will be selected for implantation. So the main objective of PGT is to avoid abnormal and also affected pregnancies which may require abortion later. So nowadays, a lot of centers are actually integrating these procedures into their ART procedures. I'll just focus on two main tests that we are using in PGT. About 80% of PGT cases worldwide are actually involved the PGTA. So it's actually the test that we are aiming to look for aneuploidy. We will be looking for numerical errors in chromosomes and sometimes structural error. This is just a general screening that is okay for everyone. But PGTM, on the other hand, is a more specific test. We are trying to look for some specific mutation that leads to pathological conditions. This is usually targeted for those couples that is already having some inherited disease that is running in their family. And they just want to make sure that their kids are free of this mutation. So for BGTM, sometimes we will actually run it in conjunction with something called HRA typing, or more generally calling blood typing. Because not only that the couple wants to screen and make sure they have a baby that is free from the mutation that is running in the family, they also want this newborn to be a potential stem cell donor for someone who is already affected by the genetic disease in the family. Usually it's a sibling. So they have actually another name called savior sibling. So you can see there are a lot of things we can actually do with this PGT testing. So I'll just start with PGTA first. Why do we need to do an aneuploidy screening? Well, the straightforward answer is that because the embryos that we've created in the IVF laboratory, most of the time, they're actually abnormal. The range grow from 20% to 80% depending on the age. It happens randomly. It is caused by meiotic uh, errors during gamete formation, and it could happen to anyone. So even a young, healthy couple who doesn't seem to have any problem all the while, they still could be affected by this. It is very, very rarely you actually come across a couple who produce all euploid normal embryos in their IVF cycles. And things get worse when the maternal age increase. So the, the aneuploid rate in you know, older women can actually go up to 80%. The major challenge we are facing is that this aneuploid embryos that's abnormal, they usually look exactly the same to a euploid embryo. So even with microscopes, we have no way to differentiate between this normal and abnormal embryos. You only get to know it after you have done the implantation, 
when you notice that uh, you fail to achieve a pregnancy, there's no implantation, or sometimes they even end up in spontaneous miscarriage. And in some even more unhappy cases, you might even have babies born uh, because they are capable of live birth. Some cases like trisomy 13, 18, 21, or sometimes those errors that involve the sex chromosomes. So why do we want to do PGTA? Because of these two major reasons. First of all, we want to shorten the duration to pregnancy. Second, we want to reduce the risk of miscarriage or even possibility of having some abortion afterwards. So you can actually look at this diagram and you can see. So in a normal standard IVF program, let's say we produce three embryos. So you can see from these three embryos on the left-hand side, you have two abnormal and one normal. But without doing a PGT, you wouldn't know that. Okay? So without PGT, the patient might have gone through three transfers and they might only get to the right embryo at the very end third cycle. So it's a waste of their time and also their energy. And for some patients, they, they cannot afford to waste the time. But if we are doing a PGTA for this case, then we can straight away get to the right embryo and get our pregnancy in the first attempt of transfer. So there was a time when we are not too sure about the benefits of doing a PGTA, but I believe the graph that I'm showing at the moment is what most of the centers that is doing PGTA is seeing now at the moment. So we noticed that after we have done a PGTA and select the right embryo for transfer, you can actually see a significant difference in your clinical pregnancy rate compared to those cases where you are not doing a PGTA when you have your, the chances of getting a pregnancy from your first transfer is similar for those patients who is younger, less than 35 years old, and you are also getting almost the same clinical pregnancy rate for those uh, that is having advanced maternal age if you are doing a PGTA. That means if we are selecting the right embryo, an old patient is having as good a chance of getting a pregnant as someone who is so much younger compared to their age. Okay. So no wonder, it's not surprising, a lot of centers today are actually adapting this PGTA into becoming a standard of the IVF treatment. Now we move to PGTM. So why do couples actually need PGTM? So according to this, the studies that I'm quoting, one in a hundred couples are actually at risk of having a child with severe recessive order, disorders. Until today, we have identified over 5,871 phenotypes that's associated with single gene disorders. But couples usually are not aware about their own carrier status until they have done a carrier screening, if they do it before they get married, or in some more unfortunate cases, they only found it out when they deliver a baby and found that the child is actually affected by some serious inherited disease. So this couple may or may not have concurrent fertility issues. So they might not need IVF initially, but it seems like having an IVF in combination with the PGTM could be a best option for them because they can actually test their embryos and avoid transferring affected embryos. And this will also help them to avoid some very difficult decisions once the pregnancy occurs. So, if we go back to the slides that we talked about just now, so there are two types of PGT tests, the PGTA and PGTM. They look like two different tests that seems to be targeting different population of patients. So I can still recall the time when I first did my PGTM in-house and went to see my first couple, happily telling them that, um, well, we have good news for you. Um, you have two embryos that's not affected by the thalassemia mutations and they are good for transfer. So the couple actually asked me back, oh, so you're telling me I have two normal embryos? And they caught me there because, well, I do know that the two embryos is not having thalassemia mutation, but I'm not sure if they are actually normal because I have never done a PGTA. I don't know whether they are having some problem with like trisomy 21, trisomy 18, because they have never done a PGTA. So the couple actually looks at me doubtfully and say, that sounds a bit silly. 
And unfortunately, I have to agree that they are right because they have gone through so much of hell, going through uh, tests and stimulations and all the doctor's sessions, the operations, and found out that the test result they are getting is only giving them half of the information. And the other half of the information, which is equally important, is actually missing. So what if I know that this embryo is not having a thalassemia mutation? Because I don't even know whether this embryo is going to implant. I don't even know whether they are actually a nucleotide embryo. So that raised another question. Why can't we just do PGTA and PGTM together in one shot? So in order to explain that, we have to first look at the process of PGT. So seven and eight years ago, well, the process of the PGT is looking like this. First, the patient will come and see the doctor, get the stimulation, get the drugs. We make them inject some hormones so that they produce a lot of eggs. And then we will find a good time, take all the eggs out. We'll try to create as many embryos as we can inside the IVF lab. We grow them. So those embryos that are healthy looking, we'll just subject them to a process called embryo biopsy. So in this process of embryo biopsy, what we'll do is we'll just take some cells out from this embryo. The cells will be sent for testing. The remaining cells or the remaining embryo will be frozen. And then once we get the result from the PGT, we will base on the results and select the embryo that is most suitable for transfer and put it back into the womb. And of course, wait for the pregnancy later. So if we look at the embryo development and biopsy, so first the embryo starts with a zygote, a fertilized zygote. They go from one cell to two cells, two cells to four, and on third day, they become something with the eight cells. And two days later, they turn into blastocysts, most of them. So when we do a biopsy, we can either do it on the third day of the development, or later when it is at blastocyst stage. For a third day embryo, they usually will have eight cells or more. We just have to make a small opening at the zona and just take one cell out of them. For biopsy, it's almost the same, but instead of getting one cell, we will be taking a cluster of cells, probably about five cells, out from the trifectidum without touching the inner cell mass. I have a video here. This is the biopsy on a blast. You need to be careful to avoid it. So this is a biopsy on a blastocyst. So we need to use a very small pipette. And then we'll just get a hold of a little bit, a little cluster of cells. And then at this time, the laser will come in. We'll need to use the laser to do some cutting on the cells. Probably three or four blasts. We won't be doing too much of it because it's going to hurt the embryo. So in three or four blasts, and then with the effect of aspiration, a little bit of physical pushings and pulling, you would be able to get the cells out. The process looks relatively uh, harmless. But remember, this is a very, very young baby that's only having about 250 cells. Yeah, so um, we need to do this process as careful as possible. So you can see the cells is actually detached. The remaining embryo will actually be frozen and then the cells will be sent for testing. So you have already seen the biopsy process. So now look at the, we are going to look at the methods for PGTA and PGTM. So about seven or eight years ago, um, the, two, the two tests are actually performed on two completely different platforms. So for PGTA, it's relatively simple and straightforward. You just send a biopsy samples on to a WJA, the whole genome amplification, run the things on the array, and you can get your results for your aneuploidy screening. But for PGTM, it's a complete different process. First of all, you need your familiar samples. 
you run your targeted PCR on your short tendon repeats that you are looking for, or sometimes directly on a mutation. And then the same thing you have to do for your biopsy cells for your embryo and compare the results to your familiar samples and make a conclusion on the status of the embryo. So the problem with this is they are two complete different processes. They need to, the cells to be processed in completely different way. So there is no way we can actually just biopsy one, take one cell out from the patient and then run both tests. So the two tests needs to be performed on two different systems. The only answer we can get, the geneticist will tell us, come on, give us two samples. Biopsy two times and give us the samples. And then the embryologist will be unhappy with it because let's say we are starting with the day three embryos. The embryos is only having an eight cells. So taking one cell out of them is already about 13% loss of the genetic material. And then for the blastocyst, well, maybe it is better because it's not so much of loss. They are having about 200 cells. So if we are going to get two cells out of a day three embryo, that will comes up to a 30% loss of the, the materials. And can the embryo still grow properly after that? Well, true enough, we have done a study on it, and this is the outcome. So this study shows that if you biopsy one cell from a day three embryo, it doesn't seem to mind. They doesn't seem to mind it too much. Their performance is still almost the same compared to those embryos that were not subjected to any biopsy. But things become very different if you biopsy two cells. You see a significant drop not only in the embryology outcome, also in the pregnancy outcome, and worse still, the live birth outcome is significantly dropped. The embryo doesn't like to lose two cells. So how about blastocyst? Are they going to have better outcome? Well, unfortunately, no. We have another study here. They are comparing taking five cells out or 10 cells out from the embryo. So you are seeing a significant loss if you are taking more than 10 cells out compared to those uh, that is only having five cells lost. So again, embryo doesn't like to be biopsy twice. And I'm not surprised with this outcome. I've been doing biopsy for more than 12 years now. Um, unfortunately, I do not have the confidence even until today to say that I perform the biopsy perfectly every single time. We are human beings. We make errors. There are mistakes. And embryos come in different sizes, different shapes, and sometimes they just refuse to cooperate with you. And every single embryo is precious in the IVF lab. So that's why we are so happy when we finally have this method that allow us to run both PGTA and TGTM in one same platform. I only have to do biopsy once because the technology has changed, the system has changed. People is moving away from the array when it comes to PGTA. We are now using the next generation sequencing so uh, for both PGTA and also the PGTM, the initial processing of the biopsy sample is exactly the same. You start with pre-amplifications, then you run your amplifications, you do your polling, purification, quantification, and you can combine both PGTA and PGTM library and run them together. In one shot, you are getting both results out for yourself. And the good thing is, they also allow you some flexibility because the initial processing is exactly the same. But then your amplification, you can actually separate them. So you can actually choose to take some of your amplification products, run the PGTA first, and then keep the rest of the amplification product, and do the PGTM on the other time when you feel convenient. And vice versa, you can just do it in a completely reverse sequence. And this is actually something that we like very much after we get into it, and we'll, I will get back to this point later. So I'll just zoom in slightly on the process that's involved in both PGTA and PGTM now. For steps one, two, and three, it's exactly the same, whether you are running the PGTA or you are running the PGTM. You first start with construct library, 
your DNA will be break into fragments and you start to do your amplifications. You put adapters and barcodes on your DNA fragments. And these fragments will in step two attach to a base. We'll do clonal amplifications. You have multiple copies of the same DNA fragments. And then this bit will actually go into step three, the sequence library. The, the bits will start to sit in the well. And the only different part is on the fourth, fourth step, that's the analyze, uh, analyze basis of the data. So for a PGDA case, you do a low coverage sequencing. You just get your general idea pictures on your chromosome numbers and structure. But if you are looking for PGDM, you, you actually will have a much higher coverage targeting those uh, sequence that you are looking for for a PGDM case. So the only difference is only in step four, but step one, two, three, they are exactly the same. So that gives us a lot of convenience. Now I come to the second focus on the today. So we have talked about PGTA and PGTM and how we can actually run them on the same platform because of the change in technology. How about doing them in-house? So doing a PGTA in-house is relatively simple because this is a test that's applicable for all patients regardless of their age, regardless of their background, what is their cause of infertility, everybody can benefit from a PGDA. This is just a standard protocol. It's applicable for all patients. So that means you have a much bigger pool of potential clients. And the test kits actually come in various size and capacity. So you can always pick a size that is uh, good and suitable for your own center, for your own load and you don't really need uh, some very high technology, uh, high, high, um, like invested laboratory. They are just routine PCR protocols. Anyone that is very well trained in doing this can do it quite well. And you will just need some basic, uh, basic laboratory setup. So when we come to PGTM, it's much ch more challenging compared to PGTA. First of all, because it's tailor-made, because every couple is different. They have different uh, scenario. They have different genetic mutation that's running in the family. So you have to tailor-made the te test for all of them. And when something is tailor-made, of course, the cost is bound to be much higher compared to something that is one size that fit all. So that become a consideration. And also for the case preparation and the interpretation of the results, you need someone who really knows the subject, who know what they are doing in order to help you because um, you want to avoid any chance of mistakes and giving the wrong results. So a lot of centers will initially choose to send the cases out to external laboratory because it just looks like something that is too heavy of an investment for someone to begin. But we decided to take this challenge up like about one and a half years ago. And what we found is um, when we so you start with the first case, surprisingly, the next one just come and the third one will just come. So somehow the things just starts rolling from there. So after trying it for one and a half years, what are the advantages we find of doing a PGTM in-house? Well, number one, first of all, we are seeing that we have a much shorter turnaround time, of course, because now you do not have to spend time sending your samples, biopsy samples out to an external laboratory. You can just do it anytime. So usually we'll, patient will be able to uh, get their result within one week. You know, patients are not very patient nowadays. So the faster they get the result, they are usually uh, happier. And also for some couple, they just cannot afford to wait for too long. Okay. So the second advantage we actually find is to reduce risk from the logistic error. So if you have an external lab, um, the logistic is almost always the part that you're going to go wrong because um, the biopsy samples, they are very sensitive to temperature. If the temperature go beyond certain threshold, the DNA will start. So once they degrade it, um, your final outcome, the accuracy of the result will be affected 
or worse still, sometimes you might not even get any results. Uh, this is particularly so if your reference genetic lab is actually overseas. You have to talk about your fright charges. You have your greatest problem with the custom. You know customs. When you have biological samples, you are very likely to get into trouble and there's no way you can argue with them. There's no way you can rush them for anything. So yeah, at least that is the experience we were having and I can assure you it's really, really bad experience when you have to actually call the patients back and trying to explain to them something happens to their cells. We have to throw out all your embryo, do the biopsy again and yeah, it's probably going to affect your embryo. So it's a very bad situation you are in. So if you're having your PGTM in house, then you can save yourself from all these worries and troubles. For those institutes that is already having a PGTA system, it's actually a very convenient choice because you already have more, most of the basic setup inside your lab. And also, you actually could see a cost reduction, especially when you're running together with PGTA. So the only challenge we mean here probably is just the genetic counseling um, before you start the treatment and also how you prepare the patients when you actually get enter into the case. The key test kit that we are using is the PGT Seek. So we actually find this uh, test kit quite uh, convenient because we literally do not have to invest in any additional equipment required. All we need to do is just purchase the consumables on a case-to-case -case basis. We can look at the situation of the patients and then we just get the suitable test kit for them. Less sample handling is needed because most of the NGS system we are running now is actually on automated. So probably about 60% of the time you don't really have to have hands-on. The machine is doing it. You have less handling, it means less error. And combining both protocols it's more cost effective. It allows more couples to benefit because you can actually bring down the cost, you bring down the charges, and those couples who really need it can actually benefit from it. It also has this flexibility that actually can help you to go further with your cost effectiveness. And that brings me back to the graph that we were looking at just now. So you see, because the initial uh, amplification uh, process is almost the same, you have your pre-amplification and amplification. So you can actually choose to run the two samples on two different times. So if you have a scenario where the patient is actually having 12 embryos, let's say, so you can actually run the samples on the PGTM first. So let's say after the PGTM, you notice that um, only four of your embryos are actually normal. The rest of them are actually um, affected by the mutation. Then you can just discard the rest of the embryo that isn't having problems and just go ahead with the PGTA with only four embryos because you are just not going to transfer those embryos anyway. So there goes to your cost cutting again if you are able to have this flexibility of running them separately. Okay. So I'll just go to uh, the, some, some of the cases that we have just run recently. So uh, these cases that we have run for the past one year, we have uh, quite, we, we were quite lucky. All of them actually end up having something for transfer. And then we actually have a 100% delivery rate from all these patients. They managed to go all the way to embryo transfer. All of them managed to deliver baby. And then for those couple who are willing to cooperate with us, uh, we have uh, confirmed the status of their, their newborns. And then we are quite happy to say that uh, we didn't have any misdiagnosis or any wrong results given. And everything seems to be very well now. Of course, um, we are not trying to say that, you know, after doing your PGTA and PGTM, you're, you're going to get your 100% success rate because you need to remember this group of uh, patients are not really having fertility issues in the first place. They are able to have their own kids. They just need the PGTM because of the genetic condition. So, yep, 
uh, I'll just summarize a little bit of our experience also when we are preparing the cases. So for all our cases, the time from inquiry, so when they step in to us, <clears throat> tell us their conditions and put in an inquiry for this test, from the time they actually step in until they actually have their procedures, the shortest duration we actually experience is about one and a half months. So the patient managed to get her procedure started after one and a half months. The one that's taking longer, maybe the case is a little bit more complicated, the patient is having more questions. Um, the longest we are having is actually one year. And for those, um, time for inquiry to delivery. So there is from the time you step in for inquiry until the time you actually get your baby in your hand. So the shortest time frame we are actually experiencing is one year. So the patient is quite happy from the time they stand in until they get their baby is one year. The one that's longer takes almost two months. So all in all, for your patients, the cost for having a PGTM is usually about 2.5 times higher compared to your standard IVF cycle. So for example, if an IVF cycle, standard IVF cycle, is causing 4K in your center, in your region, then uh, your patient probably will end up having about 10K if they want to have a PGTA, PGTM in conjunction together with your IVF cycles. And with careful planning, um, you can actually have a cost reduction from 15% up to 76%. That's based on number of embryos. The more embryo the patient is having, the more cost saving you're gonna have. So this is just some of our experience when you compare it to outsourcing it to an external laboratory. So this is the end of the thing. I'll just uh, share with you some tips. You know, we went through a rather rocky uh, way before we actually come to where we are today. So hopefully some of these tips will come in handy for you. So first of all, we always uh, try to manage our patient's expectations. We need to tell them very clearly from the very beginning, PGTA is the process of embryo selection. So you would bound to lost your embryo. Then the embryo that can be transferred, the number of embryo that can be transferred will go lower and lower because you are subjecting them to two different tests now. So with our experience, we found out that if the patient has at least six good quality embryos for biopsy, the chances of them getting something for transfer will be very good. So if you are having less than that, it doesn't mean that you cannot go for it. It's just that the patient might need to look out for the possibility that the result will turn out none of the embryo is actually usable. So six seems to be the golden number. If they are having lower than that, uh, you will need to manage the patient's expectation in the first place. And we are talking about six good quality embryos for biopsy, not six eggs, because not all eggs turns into embryos. Again, it always helps if you can improve, optimize your biopsy and cryopreservation technique in the IVF laboratory. Make sure that you don't waste any of the embryo. So you need to be aware of the time taken to achieve pregnancy because um, it is a very hectic, um, quite, it's rather emotionally uh, stressful for the patient because they have to go through all this weight and treatments and repeated visits to the IVF lab. And for some patient who is not having, due to their body conditions, they are not having that many number of eggs. You might even need to advise them to repeat the IVF cycles in order to accumulate enough uh, embryos before they actually proceed with the PGTA and the PGTM. So it is always good that you can prepare the patient on how long they actually need to wait before they can actually get their baby in your hand. So it always helps to have a good supporting system because for laymen who doesn't seem to understand anything and getting to know all these things about genetics for the first time, uh, it is very important for them to understand what they are going through and why they have to go through all these things. And they always got confused in between and you just need someone to keep on explaining and repeating the things to them. So it goes from initial explanation of the process and then also because uh, different patients, you will need different family members 
to provide their genetic information in order to help them to go through the PGT case, uh, PGTM test. So you also need someone to walk in hand with hand, hand in hand with them to guide them whose uh, sample they should be getting. And of course, IVF process, uh, you need a lot of support because um, a transfer doesn't mean pregnancy and pregnancy also doesn't mean a live birth. You just have to make sure they understand all the risks before they actually begin the treatment. Okay, so with that, I thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vidyan, for your informative presentation. I would now like to invite my colleague, Mr. Michael Richardson, Business Development Manager, Reproductive Health for Thomo Fisher, to start the live Q&A. Over to you, Michael. Great. Thank you very much, Garima and TZ. Thank you very much for that very insightful presentation. So we do have quite a number of questions that have come in for you, TZ. And first one we've got is regarding the video that you shared earlier for the biopsy. What stage was that conducted at? Um, it's the fifth day embryo. So if we are following the Gartner's uh, grading system, that embryo was a PG4 before we do the biopsy. I, I guess it was the embryologist who asked this question, so she should be able to understand it, this answer. <laughs> Great, thanks. So now we have another question regarding so how, what, what is the recommendation for an embryo detected with a heterozygous variant by PGTM for an X-linked disorder? Um, we actually practice a very open uh, you know, uh, policy with our patients. We'll just show them everything we have found. So, um, of course, we'll just advise them, you know, you give priority to embryos. You, which is the one that's best to transfer based on the genetic report. Um, but uh, yeah, it, but in the end, it's actually the couple's choice that which embryo they actually want to transfer. Okay, but right. our own experience is uh, most patients with a mind carrier. Okay, thanks, TZ. So we've got a few questions all around the same topic and that's really do you perform PGTM first or PGTA first and do you test all embryos with both analysis um we we actually quite uh, quite happy with the flexibility that this platform is giving us you can actually do it either way so we will actually um, determine this uh, based on the number of embryos. So if the patient is having a lot of embryos, we sometimes would just go with PGTM first because um, you can always choose to do lesser embryo, run the lesser embryo on the PGTA later based on the result you got actually with your PGTM. But we will communicate this with the patient first. Some patients will just say, no, I want everything in, out. Um, so you run all of my embryos on both platforms. We'll, we'll just discuss with them. Great. Okay. And so a follow-up to that one is, do you need to do any confirmatory testing after your next generation sequencing? Um, I might need a little bit more explanation on this, like um, are they referring to the PGTA protocols or the PGTM? For, I think they're referring to PGTM, so do you need to do any sort of Sanger or PCR to confirm findings? Um, we are not doing, we are not practicing the validations because uh, we went through quite a smooth process when we first began. So the flyer actually sent someone very experienced and uh, they actually walk hand in hand with us. So we are quite happy with the results that we are getting. We did run some trial and then we are quite confident with the accuracy of that. But of course the standard things still go on, like once the patient is um, pregnant, 
we always still tell them that you need to go for your prenatal testing if you are not too sure. You know, we still advise you to do it. But uh, fortunately, until now, all our babies that are delivered, the result is actually uh, what we expect to see. Great. Thanks, TZ. And, and that actually answered another question that we did have about do you perform prenatal diagnosis on patients who have undergone PGT? So yeah. thank you. We, we stick to the advice from most like PGT consortium or even ASRM. It's, it's, uh, PGT is never meant to replace prenatal testing. So we still have to advise the patient to go for it, but of course it's subject to their agreement. Okay. So we've got a, a, a very interesting question. What possible factors may affect pregnancy outcomes even after PGTA and PGTM? <laughs> okay. Um, is this question actually... Okay, I'll try to answer in a way that is related to the topic today. You know, it takes our, the embryo and also the endometrium to achieve a life birth. So if you are very confident with your culture system, um, you have very confident with your PGTA and PGDM results, that means you more or less have already take care of the embryo issue in this implantation. And what is left probably is the endometrium. So that one is probably beyond the laboratory's control and your doctor will have to be responsible for that. Great. Thanks. And again, there's, there's another common question coming through in terms of what familial samples do you need? So aside from the embryos, what other samples do you need for your PGTM? Um, this is usually like a case-to-case -case basis. So for different scenario, you probably will need different things. So you need someone who knows the subject to work it out. But some general rules you can still observe. Um, that is uh, like um, you usually will need two generations. That means the couple themselves and either their parents. Or if you have a sick child, that would be unfortunately more straightforward. Yeah, usually we need at least two generations. And can you do your PGTA and PGTM on previously frozen embryos? Um, definitely, yeah. Because um, I would say at least for ourselves, the vitrifications and the towing process is actually so much perfected. We almost expect 100% survival with this uh, freeze and tour embryos. So we have done this uh, several times as well. We just uh, tore out some previously frozen embryo. And after the biopsy, we freeze them back. Once we get the result, we just tore the right embryo out. Um, the pregnancy chance doesn't seem to be a lot affected. So they are quite all right. Sorry, I'm just uh, trying to pull up the next one. So we've got a question here about aneuploidy testing, and can you do this by, yeah, is, is just regular aneuploidy testing enough? I'm not sure what they mean by the question. Um, so, well, I can just put it this way because from our experience, like in general, about 50% of the embryos are actually aneuploid. So I wouldn't say that this is, you know, the key to success. But then uh, what I can say is that um, if you have done MPGTA, you have at least increased the chance of a patient of getting a successful pregnancy, you know, to about close to 80%, especially for young patients. That like solves majority of your problems, I guess. Great. Hey, uh, thanks, TZ. Uh, so another question coming through is, how many kinds of diseases can you test for PGTM? And do you need to create new probes for each cases that may not be in your disease list? Um, first of all, like uh, how we usually tell our patients is like this. If you can detect the genetic problem on yourself, like with your blood test report, this is some mutation that is 
uh, detectable, usually we will be able to do it with the PGTM. As long as it's not some unknown or you know complex combined um, mutations that's causing the problem, usually we will be able to do it with the PGTM. And yes, you always have to uh, redesign a new one based on the patient's condition, uh, except for those very uh, generally seeing um, conditions like thalassemia. You probably can got it almost immediately because they are already in the library. So we have a question that just wants to confirm on the technology. So the PGTA and PGTM test are run on the same sequencing platform, but just using a different kit. Yes. Yeah. So you just separate your amplification. After your amplification, you just separate your amplicons, and then you can just send them to two different tests. Okay. Next question is really around genetic counselling and what sort of genetic counselling is required to patients that may be undergoing PGTM? Um, I just generally call it a genetic counselling, but uh, it actually covers a lot of things from explaining to the patient like um, why this mutation actually runs in the family and what is their likelihood of uh, getting a child that is affected if they are not going for PGTM, what is the inheritance pattern of this particular mutation? So basically it's like explaining how the process actually happened and then give them some predictions on what is the chance of uh, getting an affected child, what's the chance of getting someone that's not affected. And also it covers the parts of like, what is the risk of doing a PGT? Because you still have to do an invasive uh, process on the embryo. So, and of course, explaining the risk of not having anything because of the results. Yeah, so basically it's preparing the patient, not just um, knowledge-wise, emotional-wise, before they actually go through the whole process. Okay, so we have another question here related to biopsy. And so how do you reduce biopsy concerns that may impact the outcome of PGT? Um, so I would take it that this question means that how do you actually perform the biopsy so that you can actually reduce the harm to the embryo? Is Am I understanding it correctly? Yeah, I, and also I, I think they're getting about the quality of the cells, so the quality of material that goes uh -huh. into PTA. So okay. maybe some of those steps that you do to make sure the cells are intact and you get good mm -hmm. results yeah, from it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is also very important. So uh, for biopsy, you need to remember that whatever you are doing, it, is, uh, it has effects on your embryo, not just your embryo. It also has effects on your biopsy cells because uh, if you damage the DNA inside the biopsy cells, it will actually affect the accuracy of the results you are getting eventually. So unfortunately, there's no shortcut. Experience is the only thing. Only thing. So just do it again and again and again and make sure you actually have a very very good control system on your newcomers so make sure they are really really qualified before they actually get their hands on those embryos that you're going to use so um usually i would say my experience is like if someone doing it often enough they probably can master the skills in about uh, six months to eight months time and you can actually see the difference. So the geneticists, after they have actually run the amplification and get the results, they can come back to feedback to you saying that um, this biopsy wasn't done too nicely, or the embryo is just lousy because the DNA is just havoc. So you can always have this um, QC going on, including looking at your amplification failure rate. You actually can know that how well your biopsy is being done. Thanks, TZ. So we, we have a question on mosaicism, and can you detect mosaicism in your embryo screening? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The the angio system is actually uh, very sensitive. We actually compare it to the old uh, array system, 
it is doing much better in terms of mosaicism detection or yeah so it gives you a much clearer picture and in a i'm not too sure if it's actually is good or bad because uh, you are now stuck with a lot more difficult decisions to explain to the patient what is a mosaicism and trying to help them to make decisions on what they are supposed to do with this mosaic embryos Right. Okay. Thanks, TZ. And so, I have a question around the number of SNPs that are included in your PGTM process. You know, because for Eshbury guidelines, it's recommended using six SNPs. So, how many SNPs are in your PGTM panels? Okay, I really have to say that this is a little bit beyond my understanding, you see, because uh, I'm actually an embryologist. So, um, I may need to check on the what the supplier is giving us. Yeah. All right, thanks. Okay, so we'll answer that one via email, but um, or maybe I can interject and say that it's more than 200. <laughs> Hey, you too, Michael. <laughs> okay, um, for PGTM and from and family samples, who should you get samples from? The parents of the embryo or other family members who have the inherited disease? Um, it is actually depending on the situation. So uh, we definitely we need the parents. And besides the parent, we will need someone else. So you will need someone from another generation. So it's either the parents of the couple. Okay, sometimes we might even involve all four of them in, or you are having a kid. So if the couple is already having a kid that is affected, then uh, yeah, we will need the samples from that, that kid. So there's another similar question that's come through. And for PGTM, you generally have the parents and pedigree. So does this mean you need to run whole exome sequencing to first to identify the mutation? Or how do you know which gene you're looking for? Oh, we will definitely need a need genetic report uh, from the couple. We need to know what we are looking for. So the initial planning stage, you would definitely need a genetic report from both of them. Uh, we cannot base on hearsay. Even if they remember themselves of being a carrier, we would definitely have to see the genetic report first. You cannot assume because uh, it will affect the accuracy of your end results. Right. So I, I think we've got time for one last question, TZ. Okay. And this relates to numbers of embryos. If you only had a small number of embryos, say one or two or three embryos, would you still recommend the patient to undergo PGTA and PGTM? Um, you see, from a um, scientific point of view, the answer is yes. What is the point of uh, transferring an embryo that you know is not going to implant? So, and of course, if you're talking about conditions that you actually need a PGTM, is uh, the more reason for you to go for it because the couple doesn't want a child that's affected with a mutation. So if you come, you are talking about the problem of having not enough number of embryos. Um, currently, we actually tell our patients, uh, we look at their AMH level and we more or less know how many eggs we are going to get. So we'll just tell them, look, you might need to prepare yourself to go for two or three cycles. We do have three of our patients that actually do that. Um, so they accumulate uh, until they get six embryos and one shot they send all the samples for it. You will be under a very tight uh, timeline because the first amplified samples will need to be processed within a six month time. You don't want the accuracy to be affected. So we just need to prepare the patient. Look, you might have to back to back, you know, run uh, like two cycles or three cycles of IVF back to back because we need to stick to that timeline to make sure we get accurate results for you. But it does work. So the patient 
finally do get two embryos that can be transferred and she managed, she managed to get a baby out of them. So with that, really thank you very much TZ. I'll turn it back over to Garima to, for some final comments. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, uh, Ms. DTN. And before we go, I would like to thank the audience for joining us today. So thank you again and have a good day.